Here I'm, I'm, five years years. Years. Yeah. I'm bad that way. There you go. <laughs> With an A on it. I am happy to welcome you to the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Thursday, the 19th of uh, May 2022, and everyone should have their notes out. We are talking about the, the disputes between popes and royals, emperors and kings. Now, the claim to papal supremacy is that the pope is the vicar of Christ, the chief human on earth, the one whom God works through, the office that God works through in terms of guiding the Christian faith and the Christian people by guiding his conscience. And this is a universal responsibility. And as it is a universal responsibility, his authority really should have no limits. In fact, Pope Boniface VIII, in the decree, you're going to want to write this down, Unam Sanctum, officially and overtly argues, Unam Sanctum, U-N-A-M, S-A-N-C-T-A-M, you're going to keep that in your head, you're going to write it down. I just remember. Oh, okay. If I read it, I'll remember it. Okay. So you wrote it on the board. There you go. Just loading it. So if I loaded complete nonsense into your mind from writing it on the board, it would stick? I guess so. Oh, the power. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what one of them I probably wouldn't do that uh, much. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, document, Unum Sanctum, is a papal assertion of supremacy because... Who do the kings go to for coronation? They go to the church. The kings swear to rule in God's name, in place of Christ, temporarily, and in a Christian fashion. Who's going to determine their adherence and fidelity to their coronation oath? The church. On this earth, who runs the church? The pope. So, Unum Sanctum proposes what might have been a Christian commonwealth stretching from the Atlantic possibly to Russia, from the Scandinavian realms down to the Mediterranean, that would have included all of Europe with the Pope as overlord and supervisor of the kings. Now, there was a region of the world that did this, China. In the time of the first sovereign emperor, Qing Shi Huang Di, back two or three hundred years before Christ, the uh, Qin emperor unifies a bunch of Europe-style countries into a single empire. Zhong Guo, the Middle Kingdom. As such, um... China remains unified through good times and bad, including, including foreign conquests. Gentlemen, when you're distracting me, you're going to distract other people. Focus up here and keep your schoolgirl antics till afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Was that too far? That was no. probably too no, far. No, perfect. Uh, I didn't talk to you earlier. Okay. <laughs> you insulted schoolgirls! <laughs> that was too far. I'm sorry, but please do focus on me. Thank you. Okay. So, so uh, the entire history of Europe and the world would have been different had the papal claim to supremacy been kept. Now, other important popes are Pope Gregory the Seventh, who's going to be the Pope at Canossa. We'll talk about him. And Pope Innocent III, who is the Pope uh, in charge of the uh, Albigensian Crusade. Now, one of the things Gregory VII does, before we talk about Canossa, is he insists, and this is the one, this is the guy that makes it stick, that Roman Catholic clergy not that, that Roman Catholic clergy be celibate. Up until this time. 
He could have low clergy marry and have families and have children. It was not incredibly common. The higher you went, it was less and less common. And senior churchmen were expected to be celibate. Why? Remember, the Christian faith is born into a Roman Empire where sexual morality is somewhat filthier than the worst part of a sewage treatment plant, where basically people marry and divorce, where kids are born and there's no concern for them growing up in a family, uh, where women are sold into slavery as little girls and boys too, and the kind of slavery they suffer is not as clean as working in the fields until you drop. So the Christian faith in Roman times is unique in asserting the virtue of chastity. And this is one of the reasons why the Christian faith in all of its forms has a focus on sexual morality that is not incredibly reflected in other great world religions, not to the same extent. But higher clergy were expected to give their entire dedication to the church. Remember, monks, as opposed to priests, had to swear vows of chastity, and that meant no family. It wasn't just about no sex, it was about their identity as a member of their family is now replaced by their identity as a member of the monastic community. So, this went on for hundreds of years with various senior church people trying to get this married clergy thing out because they thought it would divide loyalties. After all, what if a priest has kids? And those kids, uh, his dedication to them interferes with his dedication to serve the parish and the, and the, and the faith community. Gregory the Seventh actually makes it canon law that priests, monks, and nuns cannot marry, cannot have children, should be chaste. That means no sex, no family, none of that. Now, within the Holy Roman Empire, there are factions. The faction that supports the church are called Welfs. Welfs. Not elves. Not elves. Welfs. And Welfs uh, support papal claims, support uh, bishops over uh, you know, noblemen, support the pope over kings. <clears throat> now, Pope Gregory is involved in an intense investiture controversy with the Emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV. And the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV refuses to allow papal picks for bishops to be seated. So the Pope excommunicates the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, today, if the Pope, which this Pope would never do, excommunicated a world leader like Joe Biden for being pro-choice, which is not in harmony with the teachings of the Catholic Church anyway, for better or worse, even Biden's Catholic supporters probably wouldn't change their support of Biden on the say-so of the Pope. Because the modern world is quite secular, oriented towards non-church things. However, this is not the modern world. This is the high Middle Ages. When anyone gets born, it's the church that keeps records. When a baby, it's the church that baptizes. Growing up, it's the church that provides whatever education people have. It's the church that takes care of the formal education of the small number of people that are formally educated in Europe, within and beyond the cathedral schools and the monasteries. It's the church that supervises matrimony marriage. 
It's the church that does last rites. It's the church that you go to when you're sick. It's the church that you go to when you're poor. The church is a part of everyday life in a way that it is not for most people today. I realize there are exceptions. Most people in the United States and Western Europe do not have their weekly and daily routines dominated by church stuff. Most people. But in the high Middle Ages, the church was there. Whenever you had a need, the church was there. The church is what brought people together as a community. The church is what taught even adults through the sermons, the homilies, the readings of the Bible. The church offered salvation, forgiveness for sins and confession, the opportunity to join with God in Holy Communion. Henry IV is excommunicated. Henry IV cannot receive sacraments. Henry IV's realm cannot receive sacraments so long as they are loyal to him. Henry IV's realm has people who have babies that need baptizing, young lovers who want to get hitched, people who are dying without last rites. Every day that goes by, the dreams and needs, spiritual and secular, of the entire Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, this area stretching from North Italy to the North Sea to the Baltic Sea, these needs go unfulfilled. And even the coronation oaths that Henry swore are now called into question, and every feudal oath of fealty to Henry is also called into question. If you're a count and you have an oath to serve the Holy Roman Emperor, now that oath is in question because the Holy Roman Emperor is beyond and outside of the faith. And your oaths are based in the faith. What this means is, Henry got problems. He got serious, serious problems. As a result of which, this is going to be resolved. The Pope is in a castle in the Italian Alps in wintertime. A caravan including Henry IV, approaches up the narrow, windy, dirt mountain paths to this castle. Henry dismounts in full armor, goes to his knees, and begins shouting to the castle, Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I am at fault. I am at fault. I am most grievously at fault. The snow begins to fall and accumulate around the king's knees and thighs. He continues to his voice till his voice is hoarse, apologizing and saying how he was sorry and he was wrong and he recants his former actions against the Pope and the Pope's bishops and the Pope's officials. In one of the castle towers, there's a flickering light. The Pope is sitting by an ice warm fire, watching the snowstorm, watching the Holy Roman Emperor sipping hot mulled wine. It's cozy. Hearing his greatest political opponent apologize at the top of his lungs, until after a few hours, the Pope finally puts his drink down. Puts on a warm jacket, or cloak actually, goes downstairs, open, has the gates opened, extends his hands in forgiveness, and the emperor approaches, goes to his knees, and the pope forgives him. Canossa is the high point of papal power, and it demonstrates the power of excommunication in the high Middle Ages. 
Never again will an emperor or a king be so publicly humble or humiliated, depending upon your point of view, in front of the leader of the Christian faith. Canosa is the apogee of papal authority. A few years later, Henry's back to his old tricks and his politics as usual, but that's another story. Now we come to the royal claims, the claims of the king and the, the kings and the emperor. Turn it here. Remember that God had them be born in order to rule in his name a kingdom, a people, a land, a government, a society, a tradition. The king is responsible for all of this. It is the king who takes on the burden, like a horse carrying a saddle and a rider, of the good of the kingdom. The king and the land are one. As one thrives, the other thrives. As one suffers, the other suffers. No one, once the king takes his oath, can relieve the king of that burden except God through death or the king himself through abdication. Any rebellion against him is unrighteous and unholy. Any traitor against him is hellbound. The church has sanctified king's holy mission to rule. And even though the church and the state argue with one another, in the end, they are partners. Now, the kings resent the fact that each church is like its own little embassy, and that the king's law doesn't always extend within the doors of the church or within the gates of a church complex. The king doesn't like the fact that the churches don't pay taxes to him. Their tithes go straight to the church and to the pope. So, the thing about land... She's doing her torture lessons. The thing about land, the thing that you really need to understand about land as far as the government is concerned is it's all taxable. That's what Domesday was all about, the Domesday book in Norman England. It's about taxes, how to charge taxes, how to collect taxes. The money, da money, da. And kings, look at all this prime church real estate, cathedrals, monasteries, chapels, farmland, even some cities are ruled directly by church officials like bishops, like the city of Salzburg, where Mozart comes from, is run by a bishop throughout much of its history. What that means is the king doesn't get his money. He doesn't get his taxes. So these are all annoying enough. Woo! If a priest is a bad man, violates his oath, and starts molesting people or hurting people, that king is not liable to be tried and convicted and hanged by the king's justice. That priest is going to be judged in an ecclesiastical court by churchmen. And they may arrive at the wrong decision. And they may not punish the priest in a way that the king would prefer the priest to be punished. Every so often, priests, like everyone else, fall. So this is annoying. And the fact that kings cannot appoint the bishops in their kingdom is also really obnoxious. Yeah, the Pope runs the church, but the church is this diffuse thing that stretches all over Christendom. I run the kingdom. The kingdom is mine by God. 
If the kingdom didn't shouldn't have been mine, God would not have made me be born a prince, a crown prince, and become a king. So the church is interfering in my royal prerogatives. Oh, 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 and there's one other thing. The Roman emperors in times of Christ, in times of the Christian empire, should I say no? In times of Christ, the Roman emperors didn't even know about Christians. The Roman emperors in the late Roman Empire, when the empire was Christian, ran things. Not the Pope. Not the Church. The emperor was put in charge. So these are all claims by the Holy Roman Emperors and by the kings to royal supremacy. The followers of the kings were called Ghibellines. Ghibellines are the followers of the Holy Roman Emperor within the Holy Roman Empire. The Guelphs and the Ghibellines are at odds. They contend with one another. They are factions opposed to one another. They struggle and fight with one another. Ghibellines support the royal claims, Guelphs the papal claims. Now, I've mentioned to you Henry IV's problem with the church over the investiture. This is Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperor. Friedrich Barbarossa led a crusade. He wasn't going to put up with church nonsense. If anyone got in his way, he would stop him. King John of England ended up in a conflict with the church so bad he was excommunicated too for several years and almost lost his crown. And King Philip IV of France. He sets up the anti kenosis Popes throughout most of the Middle Ages are chosen in a special fashion. The cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church, who are a small number of archbishops that are selected for the special art honor of wearing bright cardinal red, have the duty, when the old pope dies, to elect the new pope. So the pope picks the cardinals throughout his lifetime. If the pope's a liberal, he picks liberal cardinals. If he's a conservative, he picks conservative cardinals. Whatever that means, time and place. When the pope dies, the College of Cardinals, that's what it's called, all cardinals in the world come to Rome. And they are locked in a room. This is called conclave. They are locked away. They can't get out. Others can't get in. Why? Because in earlier papal elections, there was interference through bribery, intimidation, like intimidation, like jury tampering today. You have some famous person, <clears throat> and there's going to be a trial, and you're an unscrupulous gangster, or you've got access to unscrupulous gangsters. You find out who's on the jury in that trial, you can do things like capture their children or let it be known that their pets are vulnerable or place charges in their homes or poison their food. You can do anything. And if you're not caught, <clears throat> your evil actions might very well intimidate a juror into voting not guilty when everyone knows the person's guilty. Jury tampering is a problem. So to avoid jury tampering with the College of Cardinals, they're locked away. And there's a tradition. At least uh, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, there are votes. The votes are secret. The votes are in writing. The names of the Cardinals' individual choices as to who should be the next Pope are written down and they're counted publicly. They're announced. And a simple majority is not enough. What you want is a supermajority or unanimity. So people will negotiate with one another. People, factions will politic throughout the day between votes to argue for this or that or the other candidate. And in the end, every time there's a vote that does not produce a pope, Black smoke, smoke is sent up a particular chimney that everyone looks for. 
black smoke, the smoke, no new pope. Black smoke, no new pope. But when the new pope is chosen and agreed to by the College of Cardinals, they put different fuel in that little stove. White smoke comes up the uh, chimney, and the world knows that they have a new pope, and that pope will soon be announced, brought out in front of people to greet them. And this this is the tradition that's been going on since the since the high Middle Ages. So a pope is chosen. But he's not a pope that's popular or well liked. So the French army intervenes and brings the pope to Avignon, a town in southern France. Pretty place. Nice place. And in Avignon, the Pope continues to be Pope. But he's a puppet, see? Pope, Pope, Pope. Hey, Pope, what do you think of this? What if you tell me to hear my voice? See? That's, I'm a Pope. See? I'm not Jeff Dunham. The Pope in Avignon is a tool. <laughs> He's a tool of the French king, and he does whatever the French king wants. So now, the French king has a pope in his pocket. He's excited. Stompy excited. Happy excited. So excited he is to have a pope in his pocket. The French king did. And close to 80 years, there's a pope in Avignon. But he's not the only pope. Because the other rulers of Europe say, hey, if the king of France can have his own pet pope, why can't I? We'll have a conclave, too. And we'll get a pope we like. So, this goes on. Pope, 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 pope. Good. Thank you. At one moment in time, there were no less than eight different popes, each calling the other seven anti-pope and anti-Christ. Now, for a Christian to call somebody anti-Christ is a huge deal, because anti-Christ is the opposite of the Redeemer, the Son of God. He's the Son of Satan to bring darkness and evil into the world. Anti-Christ is the ultimate evil. He is the opposite of Jesus. Jesus was a healer. Jesus was a teacher. Jesus sacrificed himself for the greater good. Figure out what the opposite of that is. And you're going to see how unpleasant it could be. So, war all over Europe between different factions of kings and popes. And it is a freaking nightmare. However, the Avignon Papacy is the ultimate moment of king's power over the popes. When you've got your own pet pope in your own little tourist town of Avignon, you can do whatever you want with the church. So Canossa doesn't last. Avignon doesn't last either. There finally comes a point where this chaos is going to end. We will get to that story another time. Any questions about the popes and the emperors and their various problems with one another? I don't see any. Okay. Next. The rise of cities and of long-distance trade. In the Middle Ages, you are what your daddy does. And the God and his church are at the center of all things. Those are the two basic rules. You are what your daddy does, and God and his church are at the center of all things. You're born the son of a peasant, you're going to be a peasant. You're born the daughter of a peasant, you're going to marry a peasant. You're born the son of a nobleman, you're going to be a nobleman. Either the inheritor or one of the others. If you're a daughter, same thing, you're going to marry somebody of that class. Your birth defines your identity. By the way, if you ever... Have even the slightest curiosity why I hate identity politics, where people identify on the basis of unchosen birth characteristics. I'm a woman. I'm Hispanic. I'm African American. 
And it's extended now to sexual preference and this notion that gender and sex are not the same thing, which I don't subscribe to. All of this stuff is, yeah, well, all of this stuff is birth characteristic stuff. It's mumbo jumbo. Unless the J ancient Jews are right, the Kabbalist Jews, who say that every soul floats around a part of heaven called the guff, waiting for their body, and then boop, they go and they pick their body. Unless your soul was stupid enough or lucky enough to choose your life and your parents at this time and place in America, and actually you won the birth lottery having been born in the United States as opposed to in North Korea, say. My problem with identity politics of this time is, of this type, is I don't believe you are what your birth is. I just don't. I think it's un-American. I think we're a meritocracy. You are what your choices are. If you choose to be a dishonest, betraying, lying, waste of space, then you deserve failure. If you choose to be honorable, hardworking, honest, trustworthy, loyal, you deserve to succeed. I don't care what boy or girl parts you have. I don't care how much melanin is in your skin. I don't care whether your ancestry comes from Northwest Europe or Southeast Asia. I care about the words you choose and the deeds you choose. Really, I care about the choices you make. In America, that's what it should be about. Not what you are, not how you were born, what you choose to be. Here's why. You don't get to choose how you're born. You don't get to choose who you are. I don't, I, I, I am not a believer that a person can change their fundamental nature. I just don't believe that. But you can choose to be a good person, or you can choose to be a selfish user. You can choose to be somebody that people would be proud to know, or you can choose to be the kind of predator that people fear to be alone with. You can choose what you stand for, what you believe in. You can choose on what hills you are willing to battle and risk. Anyone can. Smart, stupid, city, country, male, female, black, white, red, gold, puce. I don't care. You, as a human being, can choose your life. That's freedom. The only place where anything like that was even a little bit possible were towns and cities. Because towns and cities, you've got craftsmen, tanners, who turn hides into leather, dyers, who turn naturally colored cloth and leather into colored cloth and leather, glue makers, who turn the bones of horses and other things into sticky stuff. People who make clothing, people who make shoes, people who repair clothing and shoes, people who sell goods like food or tools, blacksmiths, carpenters, wheelwrights, tinsmiths, people who make cups, bartenders, innkeepers, people who fill cups, prostitutes, gamblers, mafia enforcers. They're all in the city, along with wealthy people, successful merchants, educated people, people who work in cathedrals, uh, priests, monks, nuns, people who work at the docks, all kinds of people, depending upon how big the city is and where it is, are going to be found in the city. And if you run a dye works, and your job is to make dye out of natural substances, which is not easy, by the way, and then color natural colored cloth so that it is dyed in a way that won't wash off when it rains or when you fall into the river, 
you need people who are good at their jobs, who follow the recipes that prepare the dye and the cloth so that the dye becomes part of the cloth as much as possible so the colors don't fade immediately. So the dye doesn't ruin the cloth either by making it too soft or too brittle. You could have the son of the wealthiest guy in town, and he could be a Butterfingers, klutz moron, lazy person. And if he is a Butterfingers, klutz moron, crazy person, you can train him from now until doomsday, and he still won't do his job right. And you will waste money, time, on everything that guy touches until you fire him because he can't do his job well. So in the city, in the Middle Ages, and in the town is the only place that is even close to being what we have as our ideal, a meritocracy. You, anyone, can choose to try to work hard. Now, not anyone can choose to be brilliant. Not anyone can choose to learn math easily. Not anyone can choose to be beautiful or graceful. But anyone and everyone can choose to work to the best of their ability. And I've been a worker and a boss. I've hired and fired people. I've trained people. I've corrected people outside of education and then within education. And I can tell you, I never had any question of when a person was slacking or working to the best of their abilities. And if a person is working to the best of their abilities, I can find a use for them. But if a person just gives a half-hearted job because they don't care because this work is beneath them and they're just taking it until they find something better, I get rid of them because that attitude stinks. It's a disrespect to my customers. It's a disrespect to me. It's a disrespect to their coworkers because this disrespect is going to take the form of a lousy job, a stupidly done job. A job that's going to require other people to waste their time cleaning up after this idiot. You can tell. After a while, most of the time, when somebody is trying to game the system. Just like you can tell, most of the time, when somebody is a liar. You may not spot it the first time, you might not spot it the thirteenth time, but sooner or later, you're going to clue into the fact this person is a liar and you will behave yourself. You will act accordingly. You will, you will not trust them unless you're stupid and you want to suffer needless pain, in which case trust the liar. It'll be fun. It's like riding a roller coaster that hasn't been repaired in a few years. You know, it, it, it'll probably work out one way or the other. And if it doesn't work out, you probably won't be around to feel the pain because you'll probably die quickly. City air is foul. It stinks. City water is polluted. Yes. So just what you said about uh, making. About what? The making. Yes. Random. Yes. Uh, there was an ad uh, just online that I that was talking about that said that if you or another whole system in, in an accident, you may uh, call this number because you may be entitled to, uh, to compensation. Oh, and then the, uh, the line was the Elmer's Blue hotline, uh, like health hotline for, for poison control. Oh, that's hilarious. That's really funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's like, you know, you're sick, you're depressed, you're sad. Call the cannibals. We'll help. Yeah. <laughs> we'll find a use for you. <laughs> Cannibal hotline. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I had not heard that. If yeah. you have a link, again, send it to me, email me. I would love to see that. Yeah, it was just the Elmer's Glue. Oh, that's funny. Anywho. <laughs> um, city air is stinky, but it's free air. And that's what people used to say. This is an axiom of the Middle Ages. City air is free air. It may be polluted. It may stink. It may be crowded. People might have body odor. Uh, people don't bathe enough. Uh, the streets are filled with human and animal waste until it rains. And in some places, it doesn't rain for months. Just think about that. You've got rats. You've got fleas. You've got disease. You've got just noisome stenches coming from 
everyone's home. When somebody uh, goes to the bathroom, they use a chamber pot. Then they toss it out the window into the street in front of their homes and just let it sit until it's washed away at some point in the future. It's not nice by modern standards. If you lived in a cow barn, it would be cleaner, probably, than a medieval city. So, it's not easy to live in the city. And you know what it takes? Money. If you're on the farm, you'll always have a place. You're born there, you're going to be a peasant, you're a lord. You've got your place assured. In the city, you have to keep paying bills. You have to pay your rent, you have to pay for your food, you have to pay for your tools, your clothing, you have to pay all sorts of things. And if you don't pay, you're on the street. Well, I'll die there. Get a job. Stinks to be you. Don't let yourself die. Take up begging. I don't care. You didn't pay my rent. Bye. That's the world in the city. So, naturally, self-interest says most people learn to work hard. Because most people don't want to die alone in the streets. So, if you want to be treated not as your father's son, not as your mother's daughter, but as you. If you want a new shot at life, if you want to do things that nobody in your family's ever done before, find a way to sneak to a city and avoid the people hunting for you know peasants who are fleeing against the law and get a job. You start out at the bottom. You're going to start out doing lousy, hard things for very little pay. But if you do it well, and you keep your eyes open, you'll find a better job, and then a better job, and then a better job, and you'll get a reputation, and people will start looking for you, and they'll want to hire you, and you'll make enough money, and maybe you'll buy your own business, and then you'll be the boss, and you'll get to give other people jobs. And you'll get to have a home, and a family, and some security and wealth, whereas your family were all turnip farmers, you now own your own carpentry shop. You now own your own blacksmith shop. You now own your own uh, dye works. Do you see how for amb ambitious people, the city and the town is an exciting place? And in fact, cities and towns are not run by feudalism. Cities and towns have their own special charters, and their own special governments. Why? Well, if you're in the countryside and you're a baron, you learn the job from watching your dad. And you've got a bunch of people who know the business is in your valley, and they help you become a reasonably good leader. Because if you're not, they're going to suffer. But the cities are so complicated. It's not like running a farm. I'm not saying running a farm is easy. Today it's very difficult. But a baron could basically command the valley without too much specialized knowledge. But if you try running a city like a, like a country barony, you're going to destroy the wealth. You're going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Nobody wants to do that if they're interested in prosperity. So cities are the only places in medieval Europe that sometimes might be republics. Cities are the only places in medieval Europe that have self-government. And usually the cities have a Lord Mayor and a city council, and that city council is often composed of guildmasters and other wealthy, prominent people who either are chosen by the Lord Mayor who knows the city and by the the other councillors are sort of invited into the club, or they're elected by citizens. To be a citizen, you've got to own property in the city. To vote in the burg, you've got to be a burger. Not a crown beef sandwich with cheese and ketchup and fun stuff like that. You've got to be a burger as in a citizen of the burg. You've got to own land. I own a house, the city I live, therefore I am a burger. I'm also fairly straightforward and honest, therefore I am a Frank Burger. You can just picture it. There's all sorts of fun that can be had. The idea is, it's Frankfurter, but I'm in no way a hot dog. 
Um, so cities govern themselves because the only people who understand those crazy weird places are city folk. And only stupid, unwise, dunderhead kings and rulers interfere with this. Basically, the noblemen run the feudal system outside of the cities. And as long as the cities don't have open rebellion, massive disease, or uh, stop paying their taxes, the cities just provide money and the kings sort of look away at all of the meritocratic anarchy and chaos going on there. God, you know, people, some people, they don't even go to church every week. Some people, they're the sons of the lowest of the low and they become town counselors? Ah, I don't want to think about it. Ugh. No, uh, I'll just I'll just take the money and I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll let the freaking chartered government of the city take care of it. Now, the economy of the cities are in the hands of what are called guilds. A guild, G U I L D, is an association of skilled craftsmen. Now, the closest thing in our society to a guild is a trade union. But trade unions, like the United Auto Workers or whatever, stupid teachers union, which I hate and am not a part of, um, they propose to rep purport to represent everyone who's in a certain industry. So, for example, the United Auto Workers, uh, if you work anywhere in the auto industry, you're a member. Whether you, what you do is completely unskilled or, or totally skilled. That's not the way a guild works. It's like the teacher's union defends people's right to keep their job even when they're incompetent. I'm a unionized veteran teacher. I don't have to really perform anymore. Because if anyone tries to fire me, the union will protect my job. Makes people who work in this industry look bad. So many incompetent teachers. Because the union protects them. Now I'm equal to the best of you, better than the rest of you who would criticize my success in terms of national unrest. That's from a song about trade unions and criticizing them. But craft skills, to be in one, you've got to have skills. Blacksmiths, carpenters, and so forth. Now, blacksmiths, oh, I'm sorry, the guild system keeps the economy stable through self-regulation. So it's not the government that makes sure that uh, blacksmiths do their job properly. It's the guild. Here's how the system works. First of all, you start out as an apprentice. Your family does a deal with the local blacksmith. When you're six or seven, you leave home. You start living with the blacksmith. For the next six or seven or eight years, you're going to be living in a corner with some straw in the blacksmith's shop. You're going to sweep. You're going to cook. You're going to clean out the latrine. You're going to do all the grunt work. But every day, blacksmith's got to teach you something about the craft. So that when you are old enough, ready to enter adulthood, which happens around 14 or 15, what you do is you then go through a series of trials where you produce head nails and hammers and saws and other tools where you make different kinds of things out of metal, demonstrating the skills that the master taught you. And if you succeed in your trials, you then become a journeyman. You no longer have to live with your master. On the other hand, you no longer can live with your master. Now, you don't get to stay in the same place because your master has, and the other guildsmen in the city have the market court covered. You go out to the countryside, you travel from farm to farm. You got any need for nails? You bring pig iron. You, you bring your tools. You bring a portable um, forge. And you go around to people's farms and villages doing blacksmith work. If you're lucky, you find a place that needs a permanent blacksmith and is willing to take you in. Journeymen are called journeymen because they're on the road a lot, like traveling salesmen. And what they do is they make things for people who need them. Now, some people stay journeymen for the rest of their lives. But the lucky ones, the skilled ones, and the well-connected ones, when a blacksmith in the city retires or dies, a master blacksmith, 
they can apply for the trials to become a master. Usually there are a lot of different people competing for the same slot because there can be only so many blacksmiths in the city at any one time, and the guild decides who gets to do that. You try practicing a craft inside a city without the guild approval, and they will beat the living hell out of you. If you're lucky, they won't kill you or maim you. If you're not lucky, they'll break your fingers. Might as well be starving to death after that because you can't do the job. If you produce a master craft object, if you demonstrate your absolute ability, your mastery over the craft of turning iron into various tools and skills, maybe even a weaponsmith or an armorsmith, but not everyone is that. If you demonstrate that, you get the opportunity to open up your own master shop, master blacksmith shop in the city. And I think that's where we'll talk about uh, apprentices during the next Any questions, comments, or thoughts? Yes? So when, like, fantasy stories? Yes? Okay, I'll be out when class is done. Thank you. So when um, fantasy stories reference the guild system, yes. it's, um, it's just like this, except it's fantastic. Yes, exactly, because they're recreating something that actually exists. Okay, we'll talk. That was the bell, I think. Yeah, this is 50 Yeah, get out of here. Have a good day. Yeah.